Hi, I'm Dr. Gwen Scott. I'm director of Core B for the CIFAR. And uh, we are very proud to present today two uh, pilot awardees presenting their results from their pilot awards. Uh, Tagrid Asfar will speak first and Julian Nypower will, will be our second speaker. I also want to remind you that the sessions will be recorded um, and uh, we'll proceed with uh, Tagrid's discussion. Uh, Tagrid is a research assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences with a secondary appointment in the Sylvester Cancer Center, Comprehensive Cancer Center. She received her MD at the University of Aleppo School of Medicine in Syria. And uh, in uh, 2014, she received a um, master's degree at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Asfar has extensive experience in tobacco re control research uh, nationally and internationally. She has more than 55 peer reviewed articles published about different aspects of tobacco control. In other words, epidemiology, dependence, smoking cessation, clinical trials, tobacco policies, and regulations. And a major focus of her research has been devoted to developing and testing novel behavioral smoking cessation interventions for underserved populations, including cancer survivors, HIV infected patients, and minorities. Her CIFAR pilot award was funded in June of 2019, and her talk is entitled Mind to Quit, Developing a Mindfulness Smartphone App for Smoking Cessation for People Living with HIV. Tagrid. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Scott. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today and thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share my research and my results with you. Uh, so now I, I think I should share my, my screen. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, the main uh, the main goal of uh, my CIFAR pilot award was to develop a mindfulness based smoke cessation uh, smartphone app for people living with HIV. Oops. So so smoking among HIV patient is a major public health in the U.S. Uh, mostly like uh, smoking prevalence. Uh, in HIV patient is triple that the general population, almost 68% versus 17 in the general population. And actually I just, I have uh, now a manuscript under review in nicotine and tobacco research where I used uh, enhanced data to study uh, the smoking prevalence at the population level. And uh, based on my results, almost 50% of HIV patients are smokers. And as you know, cigarette smoking causes almost 24% of deaths among HIV patients. And compared with HIV patients who are non-smokers, smokers have threefold the risk of cancers, double the risk of cardiovascular disease, twice the risk of developing tuberculosis, and six to 15 years shorter lifespan. So the effect of smoking on HIV patient is huge and very negative. So challenges for cessation efforts in HIV patients. Um, despite the high interest in quitting among HIV patients who are smokers, which which around 40, 40 to 75% of smokers, which considers really very high uh, interest in quitting rate, only few are successful in quitting smoking, uh, mainly because smokers uh, lack access to cessation treatment and current evidence-based smoking cessation intervention focused on the broad, broader population of smokers fail to meet their uh, needs. Uh, 
Uh, in particular, depression is a significant barrier to quitting smoking among HIV patients. And of course, this is concerning given that 40 to 60% of HIV patients have high level of depression, which is up all, almost three times the general population, which like depression rate in the general population, usually it's between three to 14%, but among HIV patients, it's 40 to 60. And uh, add, add to this, to depression, the association, there's a lot of studies showing that uh, HIV patients who smoke are less likely to be adherent to their art medication, uh, which also increased smoking related health disparities in HIV patients. So based on these facts, there is an unmet need to identify smoking cessation interventions for HIV patients that increase their access to cessation treatment, address their unique psychosocial profile, and address the intersection between smoking and HIV uh, management. Uh, so, this is how I started my application. So how can we first improve access to treatment or to smoking cessation treatment among HIV patients? Uh, Smartphone-based smoking cessation are now increasing um, and it, they, are, they, they prove to be effective and significantly increase access to treatment. And this technology uh, has more advantage than in-person, which is like more access to treatment because Basically, the patient have access to his treatment 24 hours per day. And smartphone ownership is projected almost to reach at least 95% in 2021. And uh, the increase will be mainly in minorities and low income who constitute uh, uh, the HIV community. Uh, we have only one study uh, in Florida uh, testing use of technology among HIV patients. And the results show that almost 56% of HIV patients have smartphone and among these 69 or 70% used app. So this is, uh, this is a, a great opportunity to reach out to these smokers. How to address the unique psychosocial profile of HIV, mainly depression. Uh, one promising strategy to address the high rate of depression uh, as a barrier to quitting smoking among HIV patients is mindfulness training for smoking cessation intervention. Mindfulness proved to be effective in reducing stress and controlling the craving to smoke, and they are two major predictors of smoking relapse in HIV patients. Um, mindfulness uh, training it's, was, uh, has been used a lot uh, for HIV patient, and it, it was uh, proved to be feasible and effective in, in, for example, at improving quality of life, emotional well-being, immunological status, and coping with HIV, but the, uh, it has never been used for smoking cessation. Another strategy that I thought it would be really helpful for HIV patient to quit smoking is using contingency management. So basically contingency man management is an evidence-based behavioral intervention where you provide reward to patient when they achieve their goal. And in our smoking, for example, if they, they prove that they, are, they quit smoking and provide an, a CO test that prove that they are not smoker, they will get a, a financial reward. And CM or contingency management has been successful in retaining patients in treatment and fostering stable period of abstinence in, in substance use behavioral research, including smoking. So we thought that contingency man management may serve as an ideal adjunct, adjunct intervention to mindfulness training to promote long-term abstinence in HIV patients who smoke. Uh, and another problem, as I mentioned before, uh, mostly uh, there's a lot of evidence showing that HIV smoke uh, patients who smoke are less adherent to their art medication. So we thought to further improve their smoking cessation outcomes, maybe we can help them during their smoking quit to uh, self-monitor their uh, adherence to HIV treatment to improve, 
to make it more, you know, per personal, more relevance to HIV patient. So we didn't start from scratch because, you know, like developing an app is really very, 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 very expensive. So I did an estimate with someone here at the UM and the, to develop an app, it will cost at least between 150 to 200K. So it's very expensive. So how did we start is we have an evidence-based mindfulness smoking cessation app that was developed to the general population and was developed by Dr. Brower at Brown. And it was tested and, uh, uh, and the name of this app is the craving to quit. And this app proved to be effective. So smoking abstinence was 36 percent uh, versus 15 percent in the control group. And 36 per percent is really very high and very effective methods. So we thought maybe just to avoid the high cost and since we have something evidence-based intervention, we can adapt this app to HIV patient. So the main aim of the CIFAR was to adapt the craving to quit app to HIV patient, mainly by making uh, more responsive to their need. And we wanted also to include additional component in the app, such as contingency management and, and uh, self-monitoring to art adherence to treatment to improve its effectiveness among these patients. Uh, so the content of the Crave, crave to Quit, I will just uh, describe it generally. So basically, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a treatment. The treatment schedule is 22 days, and the day 21 is the quit date. And patient has to spend five to 15 minutes every day on the app, either practicing mindfulness or uh, entering some other data, like about how they feel. Uh, craving uh, how they are, how much they are craving to cigarette smoking. And of course, it has a lot of advices how to prepare to quit. Uh, and participants have access uh, every day to one day, so they can't skip a day. They have to do it day by day until the, uh, they finish the 22 days. But after the 22 days, basically, they can, they will have access to all the content in the app and then can practice mindfulness um, based on their, uh, based on their preference. So the app has a three formal mindfulness training, which is body scan, loving kindness and breath, aw breath awareness. And it has one informal training, which is the RAIN. And the RAIN is like recognizing, accepting, investigating, and noting what's craving feel like as a rise pass away. So basically the RAIN is exercise. Uh, the patient will smoke a cigarette and think about more like recognize or understand why they are smoking, how this will affect their body and try to change their, uh, their uh, thinking about smoking. So instead of liking it, they will start uh, accepting it and understanding that it's really not helpful in reducing stress. And of course the app has other features such as social support. So basically they there is a community on the app where participant or user can share their experience with other users and benefit from their experience. And there is some like monitoring for the status during the smoking cessation attempt. So this, is, this was the conceptual framework to my study. And the, the Spiral Technology Action Research Star or called Star uh, guided the development of the new app and basically there is five steps uh, to develop this app. Start with listen, listen, where we listen to the end user to identify their need and then plan, uh, develop a plan to address their need and create the new app or the new content. And then do, which is produce the new app and then act, launch the intervention and study is the study is to test the feasibility in a clinical and acceptability of the intervention in clinical trial. So the CIFAR study will support only the first two steps, listen and plan, which will generate uh, the data for an R34 application uh, to, act to actually produce 
the new app and test it in a pilot study. So basically the CIFAR has two aims. It's one, listen, and then plan. So in aim one for listen, what we did is we conducted focus group among HIV smokers, HIV patients who are smokers to adapt and the content of the intervention. Uh, I already finished the study and I have now a manuscript under review uh, in GMIR, the Journal of uh, Medical Technology. And uh, the focus group uh, investigated mainly four, four, four aims. First, pre their previous good attempt, because we really wanted to know more about what, what did they experience during their previous quit attempt. Did they use any nicotine replacement treatment? What type of treatment they received? So basically, we just wanted, I wanted to understand more about their experience in quitting. We also uh, explored thoughts and feelings concerning the Crave to Quit app. Uh, so we have, uh, at the beginning of the focus group, uh, I developed a PowerPoint presentation with presenter uh, de explaining the app, its content, step by step. And then we will start asking them about the content of the app. And uh, for example, we ask them about challenges, recommendation for improvement, and how they think, is, is it helpful, it's not helpful. And then we also explored their acceptability to contingency management. So for example, if they are, if, if, um, they are open to this methods or this strategy, and if they are open, how much the incentives they think uh, it should be and how is the schedule should, should be provided. And we also ask them about like the self monitoring to adherence uh, to art. So basically this will help us uh, in developing the content of the new intervention. Um, during the focus group also we did uh, exercise. So basically they will watch on the video. We were in a big conference room and they, we, I connected the screen with the app and they will watch some, uh, we tr they will watch the mindfulness practice and they, they will practice with the in instructor. And then we will ask them about their experience, their reaction, their concern. Uh, all these things. So basically, we uh, we expected that they don't know anything about you know mindfulness. So we I really wanted 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 them to have the real experience and practice mindfulness, and see how they will feel about it. Uh, analysis we did the thematic analysis using and people. I will not go. So main results main results. So participant reported for uh, regarding the previous quit attempt. Uh, so participants reported multiple drug use, coping with traumatic life events, being surrounded with, by many smokers, bad experience with nicotine replacement treatment, and lack of access to tobacco treatment as significant challenges in quitting smoking. And this is very consistent with previous research. Uh, so there is a lot of problem, and I don't think really we can deal with smoking alone. Uh, I mean, uh, any, any future smoking cessation intervention for this population should consider uh, these factors because uh, it's very special for this population, especially the drug, other drug use and uh, the tra traumatic life events. Uh, regarding the craving to quit app, the participants thought that the design, um, design videos, mindfulness practice, and messages contents all were viewed as attractive, informative, and effective in motivating quit attempt. To improve the app, participants felt it is necessary to add information uh, on about the harmful effect of smoking on HIV patient and how to use nicotine replacement treatment and to complement the app with in-person group counseling to receive more support. So this actually was very important results and should be considered in the, in the future clinical trial. So they were very happy with the app, but they still feel they need the in-person interaction with, you know, with health educator or with physician uh, to help them with qu in quitting smoking. And, uh, I was very surprised that most of HIV patients in the focus group, they didn't know about the, the unique 
effect of smoking on their disease because they have uh, special special needs. They are taking uh, special med medication. They didn't know anything about the, the harmful effect of smoking uh, that that increase actually their uh, HIV prognosis and diagnosis. And participants were very open to use mindfulness with contingency management, and they thought that maybe twenty-five to fifty dollars cash. Uh, weekly as a gift card in cash or as a gift card uh, on a weekly basis would be helpful. Uh, for uh, adherence, uh, they were also open to uh, to to do to self monitor their adherence to art during the uh, quitting. But participants raised concern about the privacy and sec security of their information in case their uh, phone was stolen. So this was actually the main concern about using the app. Uh, most of the so participants noted several advantages to receiving the app treatment, such as ease of access and use, distraction and replacing habits, minimal time commitment, and the chance to practice mindfulness exercise through videos. So they were happy about the, the app. And for participants described mindfulness training as a new concept that had the ability to keep them positive and help them in, to relax, reduce stress, and calm their, their mind. Main challenges for using the app were the high cost of the app. The app cost uh, $27 per month. The limited knowledge in using technology. Some of the participants were really like they didn't have any previous or extensive previous use technology. So it wasn't easy for them to download the app on their phone. And they were concerned that in the future, they might have problem using the app. And the limited access to the in-person interaction with healthcare providers or educator that might undermine motivation to quit smoking. So how to improve the app? Uh, their feedback about improving the app included uh, adding educational information about the harmful effect of smoking on HIV treatment. And they were very specific. So they asked us to add numbers, statistics, scientific evidence with, sci with scientific evidence. Some of them also uh, suggested adding uh, pictorial messages like health, war like health warning labels. For example, a picture with a text just to show them the negative effect of smoking on their health. Uh, they were also, they didn't know uh, about available smoking cessation treatment like medication to use to help them in quitting. So they asked us to ask, to add uh, to the app information about type, brand and cost of uh, available medication for smoking cessation. And they were in favor in having combined treatment like hybrid treatment in person with the app. To get the more to get more to be more motivated uh, in getting the in group interaction. So for aim two, and uh, now I'm working uh, on aim uh, aim two, which is planning for the second step or create to create the new app. And uh, this aim includes two sessions. The first session with, will be with my uh, mentor, uh, to, with my mentor, Dr. Lee and Dr. Kariko and uh, Dr. Al-Qaeda and uh, Dr. Johnson. And I want to, to take them minute, a minute and thank them for supporting me on this application. And actually, we already done from session one where we reviewed, basically, we reviewed the results from focus group and we created a list with the modification that we want to do in the app. And the second session will be to have uh, include in the session participants from focus group uh, to uh, have them uh, involved in developing the new app. So this is session one. Uh, we already, I already, we already did it, and did, we did it by Zoom. Uh, so basically, we discussed uh, three main uh, aspects, how to make the intervention content more re re relevant, how to make it more acceptable, and how to optimize its uh, feasibility by addressing potential barriers for utilization. So basically, we uh, used focus group results 
to uh, to uh, reach uh, consensus on this. And session two is planning to to happen. I'm planning to have it in the next uh, next month. Unfortunately, because of COVID nineteen, it's becoming really hard. Uh, to conduct research, but we will do it instead of in person, we will do it uh, using Zoom. And we will have uh, the patient. Basically, we will have the plan and we will have the, uh, the app developer involved in this session where he will introduce the new content and we will discuss it with participant uh, to have like, uh, to develop the content. And then the, at the end of the session, of course, our team will discuss the plan to develop the app and apply for the R34 uh, grant. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tagrid. Uh, do we have any questions? Amy, are you collecting the chats or the questions? So far, so far there are no chat questions. Tagrid, I have one question for you. Um, have you identified negative uh, uh, negative uh, um, things in, in the household or in the community that might uh, interfere with their um, stopping smoking? I mean, like, you know, having a partner that smokes or, you know, th this type of thing. A lot of barriers. So basically, really, um, our rec our recruitment was based from our HIV clinic here, from Dr. Al Qaeda clinic. So it's very low income community, uh, mostly black and Hispanic. So they are they were minorities, and uh, eighty percent were like uh, in term of annual income was under ten thousand per year. In term of barriers to quit smoking a huge barrier to quit smoking, mainly being around other smokers. Uh, there's a lot of smokers, uh, including, uh, you know, house uh, household members and uh, in the society, like when they go to the bar or they go outside, most of their friends are smokers. And uh, traumatic life events such as, uh, you know, they are exposed to a lot of traumatic events I had uh, three participants who were in carcination. So basically they were prisoners uh, in very difficult situation and um, a female in, in particular, uh, they were suffering from loneliness and they mentioned that loneliness was one barrier to quit smoking as well. Financial restriction, um, drug use and uh, I was surprised that they said actually most of them they tried to quit the drug use so they start smoking cigarette so basically they substitute the alcohol or drug use by smoking cigarettes and some of them told me even like their doctor were okay with that because they just want them to be out of the you know out of the drug use so they were they didn't discuss or they didn't uh, tell them about smoking, cigarette smoking. And then one last question, at least from me, uh, how do you, how do you uh, identify once this app is completed or they have stopped smoking, how do you uh, document their success? Uh, so uh, the CFAR doesn't uh, include the clinic, right, I right. but but I was very lucky. Uh, I had I used money from my startup money when I started here, and I did actually a pilot clinical trial for three arms. Uh, I have a control group where they only received a brief advice to quit, and then I have the app, the craving to quit app to quit smoking. And then I have a three arms where I'm exploring the feasibility and acceptability of using the craving to quit app plus a mocha app to monitor their adherence to art. Uh, I was very lucky to be able to complete, uh, I completed 13 in each arm. So I have almost, uh, uh, I think 32 participants 
who completed three months. I did it short term follow up, so three months evaluation. And uh, for the three months evaluation, my end point was uh, quitting, was self report uh, abstinence, seven day, uh, seven day prevalence, uh, point prevalence abstinence, uh, of course, verified by CO. They have to have CO less than six uh, BPM. Uh, and quit rate is is very good in the craving to quit app. So I'm expecting that this, I, I'm, I will try to publish it very soon. I'm still working on the data. We just started working on the data, but they have very good experience with the app and quit rate was, I think, I would say 25%, which is very good for pilot study. And basically the pilot study is more like about feasibility, acceptability, you know, more than quit rate. We have one final comment from Luntita. Do you mind unmuting? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great, uh, Dr. Aspar. Thank you. I um, I apologize. My video is not coming through, but great presentation. Um, as I wrote, two things that are dear to my heart. One is uh, technology to improve adherence and also anything related to meditation uh, and mindfulness. Uh, one question I had is that. Uh, I know you tested the contingency amounts at, was it $25? No, I didn't test it. So uh, we discussed it in the- Discussed. Book. Correct. Yeah. So we discussed it and it was very, very interesting uh, because I thought, you know, they, they were, so uh, they were, most of them, they were low income, you know, population, but they said 25 to $50 were the amount that it's reasonable for them. So if they receive 25 to $50 as a gift card or as a cash every week during their quit attempt, that will help them. Of course, I have some uh, patient who said $100, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> they want to get a lot of money, but they, they even they said it like, just like for kidding, for fun, but the, they were not serious about it. Uh, so the majority hovered around that $25. Yeah. yeah, and actually we did a survey. Uh, I did a survey among, also in the clinic. And one of the interesting results was that men were significantly more likely to be interested in contingency management than women. So this could be something to be like maybe for men to be tested in men in the future. Or so, yeah, okay. I was just wondering, I mean, from the perspective of overall healthcare, um, even at $25 a month, excuse me, $25 a week, it's, it's worth it, right? But then for uh, studies or clinics to be able to sustain that is kind of a high amount. So I was just wondering, you know, if the question had been asked about lower amounts. Lower amount? Um, no, I didn't ask that question. Uh, I was just trying to explore uh, if, if to, to what amount of money to consider in designing my clinical, my future clinical trial. Clinical trial, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I wasn't interested in knowing like the lowest or the highest amount, but I just wanted to explore like you know, what, what will make sense for them to get, to motivate them to quit smoking. Yeah. But the lowest amount that was reported during the focus group was $25. 25. Okay. Yeah, because less than 25, I think they- Not worth it for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. I think uh, we need to give Julian his time for a discussion, but Tagra, thank you for a very, very wonderful discussion. Thank you very much, thanks. So now we're going to move on to Dr. Julian Nypower. Uh, Julian is a um, assistant scientist in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, the Sylvester Comprehensive Center here at the university and his mentor and advisor through the years uh, as a postdoc here has been uh, Dr. Enrique Mesre. Uh, Dr. Nypower received his PhD in biological sciences from the University of Buenos Aires and came in 
2014 to uh, join Dr. Mesri in his lab as a, as a postdoctoral fellow. He has eight publications in peer-reviewed journals, and he has presented several abstracts and posters at meetings in both Argentina and the United States. And today he will be discussing his work with his CIFAR pilot award, studying the contribution of HIV infection to Kaposi sarcoma in the novel mesenchymal stem cell model of KSHV sarcomagenesis, sarcoma genesis. <laughs> Sorry. Thank, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I will start sharing the, thank you for your introduction. Can you see now the? Yes. Okay, let me go there. So uh, let me point, uh, good, okay. Thank you very much for introduction. So I, I, will, I will start with a brief introduction on Kaposi sarcoma. So Kaposi sarcoma is an ACE defining cancer and it's a global health problem. It's an ACE associated cancer. It's the cancer most prevalent in Africa affecting men and children. And the progressive KES requires antiretroviral therapy and systemic cytotoxic chemotherapy that are difficult to tolerate and in most cases are not affected to eradicate the disease. Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus or KSHV is the Kaposi sarcoma etiologic agent. It's constantly found in all KS lesions. The infection of this virus precedes and correlates with Kaposi sarcoma. This virus is also a, a B cell transforming virus causing lymphomas. This virus encodes many viral oncogenes and host homologous and also is the angiogenesis activating genes. So as all herpes virus, the KSHV life cycle can be divided in two stages. One, first, one stage is called latency. In this stage, there is no virus production. The virus only express four latent transcripts and microRNAs. And the main goal of the virus in this stage is the persistence in the host cell. So the, epi the viral episome will divide, it's tethered to the chromosomes of the host and will divide with it. The other stage of the KSHV life cycle is called lethal replication. This stage can be induced from latently infected cells in vitro by uh, using epigenetic drugs to the cells. In this stage, in the lethal replication stage, now the virus expresses more than 80 genes is where the virus produ production occurs and it will end with cytolysis and cell death. In the laboratory, we use a recombinant KSG virus to study KSG biology that we call 219. This recombinant virus express the whole KSG genome plus three markers. One marker is GFP that is under a constitutive promoter. We, so we will use this marker to track for cells that are latently infected with the virus. This recombinant virus also express RFP and the, the PAM promoter, PAM promoter is an early lytic viral gene. So we will use RFP to track the cells that are lytically infected with the virus. And also this recombinant virus express the pyromycin resistant gene that will allow us to track or to select for the infected cells. Uh, in last December, we, we published a paper showing that PDGF receptor alpha defines the mesenchymal stem cell capacitor sarcoma progenitors by enabling KSV oncogenesis in an angiogenic environment. So in this work, we were searching for the identity of the Kaposi sarcoma progenitor cells among bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. So we took bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells from mice and we sort them for PDCF receptor negative population and PDCR receptor alpha positive population. We infect them with this recombinant virus. And after selection of, of the infected cells, we in, inject these cells in nude mice to see if they were able to form tumors. To our surprise, we couldn't find any tumor formation in new mice with these cells. At this stage, what we thought is we know that the environmental conditions where the cells that are infected with the virus are very informant very important for the outcome of the transformation of this virus, we, we took another uh, strategy. We took these same cells 
mouse bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, TDCR acetyl alpha negative and positive, we infect them with the same recombinant virus, but after infection, what we did is we cultured the cell in two different environmental media, media conditions. One media that we call MSC media that is in blue, that is the media that we, usually, we regularly use to maintain mesenchymal stem cells in the lab. And the other media we call KS-like media. This is a media that is enriched in pluangiogenic factors like heparin, ECGF, and base EFGF. So we did the infection of these cells, we culture them in these two different conditions, and we select for infected cells. And now what we did is that we repeated the tumor formation and the soft agar analysis, and we found surprisingly that only the PDCR receptor alpha positive cells that were infected with the virus in the KS-like conditions were able to grow in soft agar, and more importantly, were able to now form tumors in new mice case like tumors in new mice, as you can see here. Neither the same cells infected with the same virus, but growing in the MSC media in the blue here, those were not able to form tumors. And neither the uninfected cells in the KS media were able to form tumors. So only these PDCR receptor alpha positive cells in this case like environment were able to form tumors. And we also found that after we induce these cells in vitro to the lytic uh, replication phase using HDAC inhibitors, as, as I mentioned before, only the tumorigenic cells were able to proliferate after the lytic induction, as you can see here in the red line. And, and the, 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 the non-tumorigenic cells after lytic induction, they stop proliferating. And this growing of the tumorigenic cells after lytic activation correlate when, with an upregulation of the PDG receptor signaling, as you can see here, and also we proved that if we treat these cells, tumorigenic cells with a PDGS receptor inhibitor and we induce the lytic replication, these cells were now not only to not able to proliferate after lytic replication. So the PDGF signaling pathway is essential to promote KSHV infected cell survival and proliferation. And this allows the KSV tumorigenesis to progress. In the United States, KS was reported to be 20,000 times more frequent in patients with ACE than in the general population, and to be 300 times more frequent in patients with ACE than in other suppressed patient groups. Here I show you a, a, a scheme published by our, by our group in 2014, where we show how in a healthy individual, why a, 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 there is case asymptomatic case of infection, but in an ACE capacity or in an ACE patient, the HIV AIDS, the inflammatory cytokines, the immunosuppression, and the factors as, as HIV TAD can be very important to accelerate the process of the Kaposi sarcoma uh, lesions. So, understanding the role of HIV in KS and in KSHV sarcoma genesis is critical to the development of better prevention and therapeutic strategies. And we, we think that our mouse mesenchymal stem, stem cell model. It's very, it could be very important to try to dissect this mechanism. So our, my, my pilot grant was uh, studying the, contrib the contribution of HIV infection to sarcoma Kaposi, to Kaposi sarcoma in a novel mesenchymal stem cell model of KSV sarcoma genesis. This, my mentors were Savita Roy and, and, and Enrique Mesri. So the two aims that we have with, with this pilot grant was to determine the importance of HIV accessory genes, TAT and NEF as cofactors of KSV oncogenesis and to study the paracrine effects of HIV infection on KSV infected MSC proliferation and survival. So uh, this is the model that, that we published in our work showing how a PDGR receptor alpha positive cell infected with KSV, if, if, if grows in the MSC media, these cells, these infected cells are not able to produce, to form tumors in new mice. And after lytic activation, these cells senesce and don't proliferate. But now these same cells infected with the same virus, but growing this case like media, they are able to form tumors in new mice. And after lytic activation, they are able to proliferate. Uh, we, we also show in that work that this was in part done by the PDGR receptor signaling, but also by some epigenetic change in the host and the virus. 
So the working hypothesis for this pilot grant was to, to uh, ask if TAT or TAT plus base GFCF or where will enhance and accelerate the oncogenesis and tumorigenicity of these cells by affecting KSV transcription or are potentiating or facilitating the oncogenesis proliferative and survival signal via the PDGF receptor alpha. So the first experiment on, that, we, that we did with this pilogram was we took mouse mesenchymal stem cells that were PDGF receptor alpha positive. We infect them with the recombinant virus as I showed you before, but right after infection, what we did is we cultured them in three different conditions. In MSC media plus base GFGF, in, M in MSC media plus TAT, or in MSC media by and the combination of the two. We select these cells for, for KHV infected cells, and now we, we, we will able to got these three different cells that are infected with the virus by growing in these three different environmental conditions. And we use our controls that are the, the cells that we already published showing that these are not tumorigenic and these growing in KS uh, media are tumorigenic. So having these five cells, what we did is we perform an experiment doing, as I showed you before, a lytic induction of these cells using an HDAC inhibitor. In this case, we use Saha. And surprisingly, we, we, we saw that in fact, culturing these cells in TAT or TAT plus base CFCF show a very high, a very high regulation of AKT, PDGF receptor alpha signaling, and cycling D1 expression as a marker of proliferation, resembling what we saw in the KKS like conditions uh, in, in our work. Moreover, when we study the expression of KSHV uh, viral lytic genes in these conditions after lytic replication, we, we here I show you two viral lytic genes. The RTA is, a, is the master lytic gene of the KSHV virus, and K1 is the glycoprotein, is a late lytic gene of this virus. And we were able to see that, in fact, growing these cells in, the, in an environment with TAT and base TFGF resembles very, very good what we saw or what we see when these cells are growing in the KS like environment that leads to a transformation of these cells. And I didn't mention, but we, we also show in our published work that the, the, the amount of lytic viral gene expression is very important for the outcome of transformation of these cells. So this was also very promising to us showing that this TAT and base CHTF condition resemble the case like condition that we saw in our, in our previous work. So we next, uh, changed also because in our work in 2019, we also showed that uh, using human mesenchymal stem cells now, not mouse, but human mesenchymal stem cells, we show that when we infect human mesenchymal stem cells with KSHV, uh, it, it's, it's the, it, when we infect these cells in this shoe media, again, when the human MSCs are infected with the KSHV but growing in this KS media, we show that this only in this media, these cells were able to proliferate over the time. This proliferation was uh, correlated with a PDGF receptor alpha signaling activation again, and with cycling D1 expression, and also correlated with less virus production of these cells. So here is very important to mention that in the human mesenchymal stem system, we don't need to induce the lytic replication because in, in human mesenchymal stem cells, KSHB produce an uh, lytic spontaneous lytic replication. So we don't need to use any drug here to induce the lytic phase. And we also show in these human MSCs that if we treated them with a PDGR receptor inhibitor, now this difference that we saw here in proliferation in the two medias, now this difference is gone. And we, we show that the, the inhibitor really impairs the PDGR receptor signal. So we, what we did next with our pilot was to try to see what effect, what signaling pathway were activated by TAT in these human MSCs. So um, we found that the, the TAT was able to upregulate PDGF receptor signaling and was able to upregulate FOFO AKT when we treated these human MSCs with TAT. So after, after seeing this, this result, what we did is we infected human MSCs with, K, with this recombinant virus in the presence of of TAT or TAT plus base CFCF. And to our surprise, what we saw is that 
very interesting. After 72 hours of infection, of the novel infection of this human MSC with this recombinant virus, we saw that when these cells are growing in the media that had that, these cells show very highly a regulation of PDCR receptor signaling, both for AKT and cycling D1. And if you remember, this resembles also very much what we saw in our, in our previous work with the case like media. So growing these human MSCs after KSHV infection in the presence of TAT activates PDCS receptor alpha AKT proliferative and survival signaling pathway leading to an increase in cycling D1 that will eventually uh, lead to an increase in proliferation of these infected cells. So uh, as future directions that we have with, in this project is first with the mouse MSCs, we, with these three cells that, that we, we made in these three conditions, we want to do prolif proliferation time course experiment to analyze the impact of this lytic gene expression that we saw in the proliferation. We also want to do soft agar colony formation assays comparing these cells with the case like media that we have to see if these conditions with that or TAT plus DCFCF are able to uh, make this tra the transformation of these cells. And if we saw some results in the colony formation assay, we, we will go and do some in vivo tumor formation assays with these cells in new mice. And with the human mesenchymal stem cells, we want to do again proliferation time course experiment to analyze again the impact of the lytic expression in these human MSCs after the novel infection in these conditions. We also want to perform proteomic array to better understand the signaling pathways that, that were triggered by HIV TAT in these infected cells. And finally, we want to do RNA sequences analysis to obtain a more comprehensive view of the molecular changes that are involved during, during this process. Uh, before finishing, I just want to mention that, that yesterday we, we got very good news in a grant that was uh, made by Enrique Messi and Savita Roy as PIs. It's an NCI R01 RFA grant that as co-PIs are, are Uma, Sharma Umakan, El Gilboa, myself, and Murad Benjamin. So, and it's very interesting to notice here that two of us, Umakan, Sharma Umakan and myself, we, wo we both were CIFAR pilot recipients. This is the pilot that Uma, Sharma Umakan got in 2000. 18 under the mentorship of Savita Roy and Enrique Mestri. And the results that we got from my pilot grant and from his pilot grant were very important for this grant to have a very impact, high impact score of this grant. So I think this, this is very is useful for, for us to, to grow as, as young investigators, but also these results are very important to get funding grants in the future. Uh, with that, I will just want to thank all the members, actual and former members of the Enrique Mestri Lab, our collaborators in the University of Miami, Savita Roy and Sharma Umakan, that we work very closely in the two CIFAR pilot grant and in the grant. So that's very important. Our collaborators around USA, Susana Valente, that she gave us the TAT recombinant protein from HIV, and also our collaborator from the Argentina U54 uh, that we work together. With that, uh, I will take any, any questions. Thank you very much. Well, well done. Thank you both. Okay. Congratulations on your pilot award. I am definitely, you know, that I am always in touch wanting to know, you know, what publications and future grant awards, but definitely what you both presented today really I mean, it's just the start. Uh, you guys have very good projects that that can go a long way with good research and great collaborators. So congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm finally unmuted. You can hear me now, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Julian, um, I know that Kaposi's, uh you know, is found in different populations. I mean, in generally in older populations from certain parts of the country. I think there's a Kaposi sarcoma belt in Africa where it occurs in children as well, and then the HIV population. Do you feel that for the HIV population that it's going to be specifically be some of the protein interactions that cause the lytic phase of Kaposi's, or do you think that this is a 
something that occurs in uh, other individuals as well, or you think the mechanisms are different? So, Remember, I'm not a scientist. I'm no, just no, asking. No, no. So what, 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 what I think is that in, in HIV patients, we have immunosuppression. We have the inflammatory cytons, all of all of cytokines that all of them, it's now that they can help the KSHV virus to become oncogenic. But also, as, as I show you today, it's also the, it's also true that the, these HIV factors like that also can uh, help the virus to become on oncogenic. So I think that that in HIV patients there is a mix of these three conditions that are what, that's why HIV patients are so much more uh, great to have Kaposi sarcoma than than a patient that doesn't have HIV. I think that is a combination of these three things in those patients. So the perfect storm, so to speak. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I truly believe that is that. So and and but 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 because there is no good models to try to study this, that's why our mouse mesenchymal stem cell model that we can manage the environment of, of where these cells grow and to try to study the outcome of transformation. I think it's a nice model to try to start asking those kind of questions if really. The, the proteins by them, the HIV, that protein, for example, by itself is enough, or we need also other cytokines for this virus to become oncogenic. That, I think that, that's why this project is very interesting for, for us. Making a story, a nice story, and shedding light on the pathogenesis. That's wonderful. Yes. Thank you very much. That was Thank very you. interesting. Thank you.